Good morning, church. You know, they say that your body can be in need of water without your realizing it. You can be physically dehydrated and not know it. I think the same can be true for God's church. People might think they have the Holy Spirit, but do they? Or if they do, can they have more? We pray for the Holy Spirit. What is it? Well, the Holy Spirit is a person. It's one of the three persons of the Godhead. We have the Holy Spirit who lives inside the believer at your invitation. He doesn't force himself on you. He gives the power we need to be overcomers through Jesus. He gives us clarity of thought, discernment. He gives us the ability to understand what we should do in the times of intensity that are just coming up. Look out around you, my brothers and sisters. It seems as though we are near the edges of eternity, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is a gift made possible by Jesus' death on the cross for us and his Father's acceptance of that sacrifice for us. With the Father's acceptance of Jesus' sinless life and death for us, Jesus asks that the Father send us the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's a gift. We're weak on our own. We need God's help. We need and want his Spirit to come and dwell in us and to help us walk in the right way through all the challenges of our life. Life has always had challenges, but those who are living on the very edge, the very hinge of eternity, we have some some strong, some very strong challenges also. The Holy Spirit, a gift from heaven for you. Who can receive the Holy Spirit? Move, open your Bible to Acts in the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 5. The book of Acts, chapter 5. We might just think that, well, the Holy Spirit's given willy-nilly to whoever, whoever is uh, breathing and walking down the street. But let's see what the Bible tells us. Acts chapter 5, verse 32, in fact. They had taken the apostles and had told them to be quiet. Don't talk about your faith in Jesus. And they said, well, at verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. They refused to be suppressed. And then you look at, as you read on, we, we ought to obey God rather than, than men. Verse 30, the God whom our fathers raised up, Jesus whom you murdered. Guess they're not pulling any punches here. Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give, there's a gift again, give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we, verse 32, are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Does that really surprise you? The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey it shouldn't surprise us, though, because when we go in the last book of the Bible, in the Apocalypse, and in Revelation 14, verse 12, we find that there are end-time people. What does the Bible teach about God's end-time people? Well, they're described, they're described as those who do what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We shouldn't be surprised that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. How else do you get a Revelation 14, 12? Are they obeying? Are they just obeying without the Holy Spirit? Of course not. Uh, the, the, this people who are victorious through Jesus in the end of time, these are people who have the Holy Spirit. That's how it's done. So I ask you a question. If God's end time people keep his commandments, are they obeying him? Yes. 
If they're obeying him, will they have the Holy Spirit? Yes. If they have the Holy Spirit, will they have the latter rain? Yes. But wait a minute. The what? The, the, the latter what? The latter rain. There's a phenomenon spoken of in the Bible, and we call it the latter rain. It's a supernatural endowment of power. It's given to God's faithful servants in the closing period of our work. When? Just before Jesus comes. We might under, not understand how significant this is or what's meant by the picture that God's painting for us through the Bible writers because, you know, some of the planting seasons and harvest seasons and growing, it, it's different in different environments in different parts of the planet. And so we have something in the, in the Middle East, back in the place in Israel, the planting and harvest seasons in Israel were the opposite of most of ours. The first rains fell from October to the end of December, just before the planting season. Do you plant your, your garden when winter comes? <laughs> it's different here. These rains softened the ground, and you know, then you come to the last rains. The last rains fell from March through April, just prior to the harvest. And those rains ripened the harvest. So I have here in front of me right now every single Bible passage which directly mentions the latter rain. Every single one of them. Now I can end the message right here, but do you want to know more? <laughs> now before we study these together, and that's basically the core of our, our message, I hope you have your Bible with you, we're going to study all these passages, there's about seven of them, we're going to look a little bit more at some than at others, but uh, before we study these passages, I have an uh, item for you from a little book called Testimonies to Ministers. And this is, uh, in one place, one of the best resources for what the latter rain's about. It's just two or three paragraphs. I'm going to just share that with you at this time. So from Testimonies to Ministers, we read this. In the east, the former rain falls at the sowing time. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. Under the influence of the fertilizing showers, the tender shoot springs up. The latter rain, falling near the close of the season, ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit as the dew and the rain are given first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character we are to be wholly transformed, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Okay, two more paragraphs. The latter rain ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. There is to be first the blade, then the year, after that the full corn in the year. There must be a constant development of Christian virtue, a constant advancement in Christian experience. This we should seek with intensity of desire that we may adorn the doctrine of Christ our Savior. Just a few paragraphs there, and I know you'll ask, so that's Testimonies to Ministers, page 506. 506. In fact, I will tell you that the writings of Ellen White are absolutely bristling with statements about the latter rain and about these, these things. So there's a lot to study there if you're interested. But I believe we should always start with the Bible. So we're going to spend most of our time now looking at these seven or so main Bible passages that talk to us about the latter rain. Let's start with the Bible and in its context. So let me invite you to open your Bibles again now, and let's turn back, and we'll go through from the back to the front. We'll start at Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, Pastor, I've never started a Bible study of the latter rain in Deuteronomy. 
Well, after today, you won't be able to say that. Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is the very first reference in the Bible that speaks to us about the latter rain. We're going to read verses 13 through 17. All right, that's our first stop. Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 17. And here's what the first thing God ever told his people about the latter rain explicitly. Here it is. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all of your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Friends, if we want the latter rain, if we truly, actually, meaningfully want it, there are conditions. Earnest obedience to God is described here as loving God. Some people today are saying, oh, obedience is legal, a legal religion, it's legalism. Moses, as he wrote Deuteronomy, told us that we, if we earnestly obey the commandments to love the Lord your God and serve him with all of your heart and all your soul. Boy, that sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Deuteronomy chapter 11. So there's a condition going on here. It is necessary. Earnest obedience to God is loving God and serving him with all my heart and with all my soul. If we obey him in his power, honestly living up to the light that he has given, then he will send the rain in its season. What a promise. What a promise. So the first is the, first is the former or early rain. That's what gets the early stages of spiritual growth started. And notice that to have a successful harvest, you need both the former or early rain and you need the latter rain. Everyone wants to jump over the first rain and go straight to the latter rain, don't they? But some effort is involved. If we're too lazy, there won't be a crop. If you don't plant your garden, you won't have tomatoes later on. You might have some weeds, but you've got to plant your garden. Notice these warnings given in Deuteronomy. If our heart is deceived, what will we do if we turn aside and serve other gods? That's apparently a risk all the time. Other gods come in many shapes and sizes. Sometimes another god is an idea. Sometimes another god is a material possession that you want or that you have. Did you notice that another god can be something you don't have? It's something you want. But to search for it, to seek for it, to make it the primary value, that is false worship. So there's the warning. If we turn aside and serve other gods, then God will shut up the heavens so that there be no rain. If there's no rain, how many tomatoes? If there's no rain, you won't be getting the latter rain. So Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 17, very important passage, sets the tone. Now the next one is less important, but we'll look at it because we're going to look at all of them. It's Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. And we will not linger here long at all, just, just to make sure we get them all here. But we're looking at Proverbs 16 and verse 15. It, it simply speaks about having the king's favor. And it says that having the king's favor is like a cloud of the latter rain. What's interesting today, a lot of people aren't that interested in having the king's favor. They don't care about the favor of God their king. But... God is the source of all blessing, and our need is so very great. We should have the favor of our king. 
And so it's described in the best way that one of the proverb, the writer of the Proverbs, one of the ways he wanted to describe it was, you know, it's like having a cloud of the latter rain, the favor of the king. Let's go on to one passage which is a little bit more significant, and that's over in the book of Jeremiah. There's two passages for us in Jeremiah, and this one is at chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah, you know, the northern ten tribes have already been taken captive, pretty much. And you have the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And that's kind of the last remnant, so to speak, of Israel. And what's it doing? Well, it's doing all kinds of crazy uh, false worship. And God sends his prophet, Jeremiah. In fact, the institutions that God had sent there to help the nation, the princes, the priests, the prophets, and the king, they were all problematic. They were all off of God's plan. Jeremiah, though, was a true prophet, and he wrote that he uh, speaks this in Jeremiah 3, verses 1 to 5. He's going to mention the latter rain. Let's see what it says. Jeremiah 3 now, verses 1 to 5. If They say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, and yet return to me, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not cry from this time to me? My father, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. And of course, go, Jeremiah goes on to call for repentance, which seems to be his life mission, to call for repentance in Israel. So the book of Jeremiah records God's strong and relentless attempts to bring his people back from their unfaithfulness. The institutions had all gone wrong, but you know what? God didn't give up. God just kept working. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah had a lot of work. That's one thing about uh, prophets. You might not want the job of a prophet, but there's a lot of, there's a, just a few things in the world have a lot of job security. Being a prophet has a certain amount of job security, at least until maybe you're murdered for it. But anyway, it's up to that point, you've got a lot of job security because God's people usually need your help. And so the prophets come, and here we have a nation that's infatuated with material things, and the nation looked kind of prosperous. Hey, things are going pretty well. The economy's way up. But all those compromises soon led to the most open apostasy and unfaithfulness. And after rejecting all of God's entreaties, God caused the whole nation to be carried away to Babylonian captivity. God kind of put in a reset of the nation across the board. This passage comes before all of that, but you know what? It shows us what happens when that condition of obedience is lacking. It says right here, verse 3, Therefore, watch out for the therefores, Therefore the showers have been withheld, no latter rain. Okay, so that's Jeremiah 3, 1 to 5. Flip a page or so over, maybe two pages, to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah 5. We're looking now at verses 20 to 24 in the chapter 5 from the prophet Jeremiah. And here's what that says. Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. 
They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives the rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. And then in verse 25, he says, your sins have turned these things away. There you have it. Jeremiah 5, 20, and the pieces just following. Open and indifferent sinning prevents the latter rain. Our sinning prevents God from doing the good that he would do for us. Because it says it right there in our text, doesn't it? They have revolted. He would have done good for them, but they had revolted and departed. God didn't depart. The people departed. And then they really did depart. God said, guess what? You're moving to, you're moving to Babylon. 70 years for you. So that's the way that worked out. And then a new generation was born and came back. God brought them back. But most of these people died in Babylon. What an ending. Well, anyway, let's go over now to the next one, and this is in the book of Hosea. Now, you might say, those are kind of gloomy passages, aren't they, Pastor? Well, there's the, the next couple, there's a couple here that are better. <laughs> but I wouldn't say any of this is gloomy. Now, Hosea is right after Daniel, if, if you uh, are just poking around to grab it there. So go to the end of Daniel, and the next thing you'll find it should be Hosea. So we're going to Hosea in chapter 6. Every passage in the Bible that directly speaks of the latter rain. By the way, you know that when you look in your concordance and you look up something and you, you, put it, you type it in maybe on your phone and you do a search for that explicit thing, you've only really begun the Bible study because there are many times and many places the Bible speaks about something, but it doesn't use the same words. So we're using every explicit mention, but there's more in the Bible about the latter rain than just explicitly these, but these are a good start. Hosea 6, verses 1 to 3 now. Hosea 6, 1 to 3. And here's what the prophet Hosea, what God speaks to us through his servant Hosea. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. The latter rain. You know, God disciplines us with a purpose. The prophet Hosea likens receiving God's help to the latter rain. His point is the necessity of our receiving his help. He wants to give us the latter rain. God wants to give it to us, but he withholds it. Why does he withhold it? He sometimes has to withhold his gifts for our own good. When we return to him, there he is waiting to give us this necessary and precious gift. I like what Hosea says. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn, you know, he has chastened us, he has disciplined us, but he will heal us. And I like it, the latter part of verse 2. When he gives the latter rain, why does he give it? That we may live in his sight. Well, that we may live. This is a gift so that we can live in his sight. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. See? So anyway, something kind of hopeful there. A call to return. Go on just a few more pages now over to Zechariah chapter, I'm sorry, go over to Joel. Now I know that Joel chapter 2 is probably one you're familiar with. Let's look at that for a moment. Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. This is one you will be familiar with, I think. All right, and here are what those lines are say what God says to us in this part. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down to you. 
the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Then no, the, 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 the threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So here we learn what? God will ripen his harvest. It's not a matter of if, but when. God will send the latter rain. He will send the former rain. He will give his people what they need to grow to a ripe spiritual harvest. But first, first it seems there's a season of rebellion, backsliding, and departure from God. And you know, isn't it true? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I think that's true. But ultimately, there will be a harvest of ripe wheat. The question isn't whether God will prevail. The question is, Will he prevail in our time? Will another generation finish? It seems to me that the safest plan of action is to finish the work now. Things don't seem to be improving in many respects in our world. But here we have a positive line. God's going to give it. It's just a matter of whether you're going to get it. Let's go to uh, Zechariah chapter 10, just another few pages further on. If you poke on through in your Old Testament there, near the end you'll find Zechariah. All right. Zechariah chapter 10. So almost to the end of the, bio, of the Old Testament. Now we're going to look at these verses 1 through 7. I hope you notice we're looking at these. We're trying to look at these statements, especially in their context. We're looking at not just the, the, the phrase or the sentence, but what's being said all around it. Because we're trying to be good Protestants here, right? Zechariah 10, verses 1 to 7 now. And here we go. And this is also, I regard this as one of the more positive pieces. Ask the Lord for rain when? In the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back, because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall, shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. And there's more, but those first seven verses... say a lot of interesting bits, don't they? God is sending the latter rain. We need to seek for it. He tells us what to do. What are we to do? Ask for it. That's one thing we need to do is ask for it. Although things often appear hopeless, you know, his people are going to be, I wouldn't say we probably look too much this way now, but his people are going to be like soldiers in the battle. And he describes this victorious people, just like they're, they're just conquering. And that's the picture that he gives us. Although leadership goes far astray, sometimes in the church, God has his ways of dealing with errant leadership. Our part is to labor on. Our part is to live and give the third angel's message faithfully, in spite of all the departures of, from truth that we see or that we think we see. And we need to stand our part in the battle line, and God will be with us. God is going to be victorious. He says, ask. Who does he say to ask? He says, for you to ask, for me to ask. 
ask for the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. I don't have the reference here, but if you search for it, it won't take you long to find it. Somebody asked Ellen White, are we living in the time of the latter rain? Ellen White said what? This is the time for the outpouring of the latter rain. Everyone who wants it can have it. There's enough for everybody. It's not a closed, a, a fixed sum uh, thing. Sometimes in our family, we buy, we buy bagels. And we've got to be careful with the bagels because everybody wants, wants the bagels. Cinnamon, cinnamon uh, raisin bagel. So there's only so many bagels at one hit, and it's, we should pass them out fair. So it's a fixed sum. God does not have that situation with the latter rain. There is enough for you to be filled to the full. There's enough for me to be filled to the full. And there's enough for every servant of the Lord Jesus to be filled to the full. God has what we need. There's one more explicit reference, and this is all the way over in the New Testament in the book of James. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 7 there. And then I'll have a uh, fascinating quotation for you, and then we'll be basically done. But let's look at this. James 5, verses 1 to 7. The first part of this passage speaks to the, <clears throat> the rich people. By the way, did you notice that a lot of these things we're reading, don't they sound a little bit like the world we're in today? They really do. And here, I can't help but feel that some of this sounds like some of our, all the wealth that's piled up today in just one or two places. But so the first verses, we're going to hear a sort of a uh, address to the hyper-rich that are not on God's team, and we're going to then get an address to God's people. So let's hear what it says. James chapter 5, 1 to 7. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, now he shifts to, the, to you and I, the believers. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain, Verse 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Friends, sounds like today. James calls for you and I to do what? To persevere. Like the farmer labors and waits, labors and waits. We are to labor and wait. We're to do our part. Those who would lead us into apostasy, they will not prevail. The, we are not to lose heart. We are not to lose hope. We are to persevere, and we will see the salvation of God. God is on his throne still. He's not quite done, but, boy, things are getting near the end. Seems that way to me. We already read in Isaiah 55 a couple of verses. There's a lot of good stuff going on there about God's word not coming back empty and the rain he gives. I'm going to just suggest that as a place for further study. But let me move to uh, the last thing I want to share with you. <clears throat> and this is an extended quotation from a book you might have on your shelf. It's called Early Writings. Early Writings, starting at page 270. And this is going to culminate in a statement that has to do with the latter rain. But listen to what happens just before the latter rain. I think you're familiar with this, but let's just look at it again one more time. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. 
They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. I saw the test that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded, the solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Said the angel, listen. Soon I heard a voice like many musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I had ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, and the angel said, look. My attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their faces expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the anguish, the agonizing struggle they had passed through, yet their features marked with severe internal anguish now were shining with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory and had called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy sacred joy. The numbers of this company had lessened. Well, that's a sad line. Let me finish, though. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it did not obtain it, and they were left behind in the darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. And a few paragraphs further down, she said this. The honest, who had been prevented from hearing the truth, now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone, and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what made, I asked what had made this shaking, what had made this great change. An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. That all begins on page 270 of early writings. So that's the scenario that we face. It's kind of marked out there pretty, pretty plainly for us, isn't it? The shaking that we're going through is just one of many, but God often has to initiate a sorting out among his people, and those of us who want to be right, we can be right, but we're going to have to put in some effort. Now, somebody says, Pastor, that really sounds difficult. I'm not sure how difficult it is if we have God's strength with us. It's his strength, not ours. The mind often wonders, and what we need to do is what? We need to bring it back over and over. And sometimes we we bite off more than we need to bite off. You know, we're really concerned. I'm really concerned that I won't be sinning, you know, a week from today. Well, maybe that's not the best way to look at it. The best way to look at it might be, I want to be victorious right now. I don't need to borrow trouble. Sufficient for today is my challenge, right? I don't need to borrow trouble from next week or next month or next year. I don't even really need to worry about tomorrow. What I need to do is say, Dear Father, I just want your spirit to be in me right now. That's That's what I need. And if I'm tempted right now, then what I need to do is what? I need to have... God's spirit with me right now. I need to pray for the spirit, ask for his help right now. And if you pray, if you pray maybe a fairly short time, maybe 30 seconds, maybe two minutes, you know, the devil often runs and flees away because he hates the sound of the name of Jesus. He hates the idea that God's spirit is dwelling with you. He doesn't like the the smell of the good angels that come and hang with you when you ask for God to have God's help. The devils just hate that. They disappear. So, friend, if you feel like this is some kind of impossibility, you're biting, you're putting too much food in your mouth in one bite. Just take the moment. Just take the moment and serve Jesus in the moment. God will give you exactly what you need. And if you don't finish, if you are unsuccessful in that moment, if if you're still struggling, pray for another minute. If you're unsuccessful, pray for another minute. 
is an eternity worth a few minutes of prayer? And you know, God will give you what you need. Friends, every church in the state of Michigan should have the Holy Spirit. Every church in the state of Michigan should have the latter rain. It's a gift. It's like you don't have to go home and check and see if you've got enough pennies to get it. Jesus paid for it for you. It's a gift to you. What you need to do is ask for the rain in the time of the latter rain. And I'm telling you today, we are in the time of the latter rain.